as we came into town, uh, there was this welcome sign uh, that truly just stuck out. And it said, Williston, North Dakota, Boomtown, USA. Um, you know, we've been called America's next boomtown here in, here in Sioux Falls. Uh, what we wanted to do was to kind of get some perspective on another true boomtown in America, and that, and that was uh, Williston. Uh, in, in Sioux Falls, we certainly have multiple legs on our, on our economic development stool, and uh, we're very, very blessed by that. Uh, of course, in Williston, their driver for their boom is uh, the oil frack, uh, fracking that is happening uh, there. We, uh, we wanted to get some pers give you some perspective of, of what we learned, uh, what they've tested, uh, yes, some mistakes uh, that have been made over the years. Uh, we also want to be, make it very, very clear that our goal this morning uh, is, is truly not to criticize what we have found. Uh, but we did truly want to just compare the different booms, uh, the different boom towns, and, uh, and how each of us has, has managed that. Uh, today, Mike and I, we plan to give you at least uh, 10 takeaways from our visit. Um, it was certainly, we, we found it fascinating how they've managed their boom town, and uh, we're gonna kinda, get, kinda give you some perspective on that. Uh, for the media, what we'll do is we're gonna alternate. Mike's gonna talk about one, then I'll talk about one, and we'll get through it as efficiently and productively as we can. Uh, and then ultimately, we hope you find it as fascinating as, as, as we did. Uh, Mike, uh, I'll, I'll let you start. Okay, thanks, Mayor. Uh, the first takeaway that I brought back was just under the category of general growing pains. Uh, when you think about Williston, if you're familiar with where it's at, on the western edge of the state, uh, they've gone through a tremendous amount of growth because of the oil boom. And right now their population is somewhere in that 30,000 range, just smaller than the city of Aberdeen, South Dakota. But over the next five to six years, they're talking about their population could potentially double to 60,000 people. Uh, so when you're dealing with that amount of growth and that rate of growth, there's three things that they're really struggling with. One is they need to look into the future. Um, what are plans for roads, for infrastructure, for development? And what they're discovering is that by the time they get these plans done, in many cases they're already out of date because things are happening so quickly. Uh, second of all, when you're looking at this rate of growth and this amount of growth, how do you budget for capital improvements and how do you prioritize for capital improvements? And we might overlap some of these comments, but that's okay. But they're projecting that over the next six years, their capital needs are gonna reach about a billion dollars, a billion dollars of capital improvement needs. Uh, they're just undertaking now uh, a new wastewater treatment plant that'll cost over $100 million. They have a lagoon system and if, if, you, if Mark Cotter was sitting here, he could really help you understand a city right now of 30,000, it doesn't make any sense to have a lagoon system. So, and they realize that, so they're looking at budgeting and, and, and moving forward with this wastewater treatment plant. But as a result of that, their sewer rates are gonna double. Uh, so again, how does that impact the community? They also are going to need to relocate their airport because it's too small. Uh, for the number of flights, the type of flights that come in there, they're looking at actually moving their entire airport. Uh, they've gone through a very rigorous annexation program in recent years, and they've actually tripled the size of their city limits since 2010. So in less than four years, they've tripled the size of their city limits, which is now about 20 square miles compared to our 75 square miles. So the third thing is just looking at the quality of life and citizen attitudes, and we deal with some of that all the time in our community. Um, the local residents actually are more concerned about the pace of growth, the type of growth, what's happening to their community hmm. since they've lived there for many years. But when you talk about some of the newer residents, you know, they're more receptive to some of the things that are going on, and so we heard a little bit about that. Um, and I'm gonna let the mayor talk later on maybe about their budget issues, but uh, that's really some just significant growing pains when you look at that 
that pace that I thought was pretty fascinating from a planning perspective. So now, how does, how does Williston manage this growth? Uh, this is incredibly interesting. They use a commission form of government uh, in, in Williston. Uh, they have an elected president, president uh, which is kind of like their mayor uh, in, in Williston, uh, and, and he is elected by, by the citizens, or she. In this case, it's a, it's a he. Um, get, get ready for this. It's a, it's a part-time job. Uh, the president slash mayor is, pay, is paid $13,000 a year. Uh, the commissioners are paid $8,000 a year. And um, the, the, the question that Mike and I kept, kept pondering is, is how is a part-time government, these leaders, how are they, how are they managing the growth ultimately uh, for, for this city that is projected to, to double in size in, in five to six years? Um, one of our, the very first groups that we visited was the planning and zoning team. Of course, I had Mike Cooper along with me, so we had to visit that group. We walked in and identified their planning and zoning and code enforcement team for the entire city. One of the fastest growing cities in America. They've got five people within it. Five. And their code enforcement person has turned over, uh, they've had three code enforcement people in the four years that, we, that they've been there and the current one is leaving right right now. Um, in order to keep any government employees in the city of Williston, uh, because remember, they're competing with this very, very aggressive private sector. Uh, they've got 225 government employees today. All of them receive government assistance in terms of their housing. Uh, they are paying $1.4 million a year to provide housing assistance to every government employee within the city of Williston. Um, they're going to hire 300 more employees in the next six years. And again, with that, uh, I don't want to say guarantee, but they will have to provide uh, um, housing assistance for all of those government employees in order to get them to serve uh, the, 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 the citizens of, of, of that town. Um, here's a little, here's a, little um, a quote for you. We were, we've been told that to, it is more expensive to live in the city of Williston than it is to live in Manhattan. Uh, and, and that has been confirmed. Uh, just to kind of give you an example, we went and visited apartment complexes in the, in the city of of, uh, of Williston. And as you know, uh, we've got a boom when it comes to condos and apartments in the city of Sioux Falls. Well, a condo or, I'm sorry, an apartment, a three bedroom apartment with two bathrooms uh, starts at $260,000 uh, in, in the city of Williston. Uh, again, just want to give you some perspective on, on, on that boom. Um, they are looking to hire a city manager. Uh, but again, today, they've got a commission form of government, so each one of their commissioners is responsible for the oversight of all the things that are happening in that city. Um, they are looking to hire a city manager, of course, not, not being critical. One of the things that Mike and I were trying to figure out is, why wasn't that done three years ago? Uh, but again, these are growing pains uh, that, that they've got and uh, again, just trying to give us some, some comparison contrast with, with, with Sioux Falls. Um, some other very, very quick thoughts. They've got a volunteer fire department. Their new jail that they just built is completely full. And if there is going to be a jury trial in the city of Williston, it takes at least a year for that jury trial to commence. And of course, if there's a judge that's required for the jury trial, and of course that's going to be the case, uh, they don't know where they would put him or her um, uh, within, within the city. Uh, again, just there, there's so many other stories like that. But again, uh, you know, here in Sioux Falls, we're, we're always struggling with how is Sioux Falls handling the boom? Well, uh, give you some perspective. Uh, there's other boom town challenges that are out there, right? One of the other big challenges, just to continue on with the whole topic of housing, 
construction. It's just a huge issue, not only the cost, but the availability. Um, and again, just to give you a perspective, here's a city of 30,000. Sioux Falls is over 165,000. Through the end of August of this year in Williston, they've built almost 980 housing units. They've permitted almost 980 housing units. We've done about 1,295, and it's a big year for us. Um, the total construction value of all their building permits so far through the end of August is just over $231 million. We're at about $397 million. Um, but what's interesting is when we toured some of the city, and we didn't get to see a lot of it, but some of the areas that we saw, it looked like all they're building is apartments and maybe a little bit of single family. But uh, as I got some of their data off their website yesterday, um, their total building permits are about 60% residential and about 40% non-residential. Our total building permits through the end of August, 60% residential, 40% non-residential. So there's a interesting similarities, but again, it's the scale of a 30,000 population city building that much housing compared to, to a city of our size. Uh, I want to continue on with this whole hierarchy of housing because it, it was pretty fascinating. They started out with, with the temporary housing demand uh, when this whole boom started of what they call man camps. And these man camps, I don't know if we could call them dormant, you've got a better term for them, but um, it's, it's, it's housing for these workers that come in, uh, that work the oil rigs, they work maybe two, three week shifts, and then they're off for a week or so. So this is their living quarters, it's primarily single men, and these man camps, in the city of Williston there's about 2,000 beds of these man camps. They've actually put a moratorium on them now because they're trying to look at other housing options. But outside of Williston, um, in Williams County, they're building man camps as well. The next type of temporary housing is the subsidized worker housing. Uh, and again, the mayor talked about the city is doing some of that, but some of the companies are also paying for apartments or other housing opportunities for their workforce that are not in these man camps. And then you've got all the apartments that are going up, the rental units. You've got some manufactured housing. We saw a few of those parks that are also expanding. And then you've also got some single family housing going up. And actually this year, they're seeing a little bit more single family than what they've seen in past years. So that's what they're trying to do is get more permanent housing as opposed to all the temporary. But again, the cost of housing is so high because of land, because of labor, and because of materials. All of those are very expensive. And the three bedroom apartments are in that range of $3,000 a month for rent. Um, and again, higher rent than Manhattan. <laughs> a single family home, the average home sales value of a single family home is about $350,000. So you can imagine when you're trying to bring in a workforce, uh, how much impact that has uh, and what impact it has on the community. So it's a, it's a pretty fascinating issue again that we thought we should bring back and share with you. How in the world is Williston paying for all this stuff? Uh, they now have hit the one uh, million barrels of oil produced per day uh, in, the, in, in the area of, of, of Williston. Now, uh, all this money is certainly uh, coming in, it's being generated, but here, here also was kind of some interesting comparison contrast with Sioux Falls in, in South Dakota. The state of North Dakota basically controls that fracking revenue and the purse strings associated with it. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, Williston, just like Sioux Falls, were always lobbying the state for more and more of, of that share of, of, of the pie. Um, um, but just like in Sioux Falls, it's been a challenge there. Uh, but the state is doing more and more to help out cities like Williston, such as uh, really working to improve the roadway system uh, that, 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 that we saw there. But here's a big, big takeaway. Uh, a, a big one, and, and, 
And this is something that I, I certainly would, would lobby for in the city of Sioux Falls and in the state of South Dakota as well. The city actually has the ability to add a penny sales tax for very specific projects. And uh, in Williston, they've, they've actually utilized this in, in, a, in a big way. Now, you need voter approval, of course. Uh, it needs to be for a specific project. And yes, there has to be an end date uh, in terms of when this funding or this sales tax would, would stop. But they just did it in the city of Williston. And with that, uh, they've been able to take half of that penny and use it to build a $70 million recreation center. And then the other half goes for uh, uh, establishing parks within, within their town. And uh, we, we drove around that, that city quite a bit, and we did not see a lot of parks, but they ultimately do have a goal to establish a new park within a mile of every home in that city. In Sioux Falls, we've already got a park within every half mile, that's our goal. But again, they're just in this, in this catch-up mode uh, in, in a big, big way. And then uh, I, I'd love the Minnehaha County folks to, to, to listen to this specific part. They are also working with the legislature in North Dakota to uh, uh, establish another penny tax, uh, and with and and here's their uh, here's their operatus, uh, here's what they're trying to with, to do with that extra penny. They want to take half of that penny and put it towards the county, and they want to take the other half and put it towards the cities and and the towns. Uh, uh, I, I thought that was very, very intriguing. I mean, you, you're hearing from the folks here in Minnehaha County how, you know, they're, they're burdened with the boom town of Sioux Falls. Uh, you know, the city is growing, flourishing, doing quite well, and then you've got the county, of course, that, that has to uh, uh, take care of some of the social needs, uh, the social ills that, that come along with that growth. Well, guess what? North Dakota has the same thing. And uh, right now, they're looking at proposing with their legislature another penny uh, to, to add on top of that. Uh, again, um, I think that if you are in a boom mentality and if you are going to uh, keep up with that growth, you have to realize it doesn't come for free. And uh, one of the things that we learned in, in North Dakota is that they've got more flexibility than we have in Sioux Falls and in South Dakota to help keep up with that boom. When you're seeing that rate of growth, um, how does their development process work? Um, and one of the things that we found out is virtually all of their development is coming in from outside. Uh, when we went to the planning office, the, the administrative person that we stopped and talked to, her comment was, nobody is from Williston. Nobody is from Williston. Well, she was, but nobody yeah. else is. And so when you're dealing with that type of, of clientele, what they said is that you really need to hold the developers accountable. You need to hold the developers accountable. And they do that through development agreements, through their standards and requirements. But again, as the mayor said, they have pretty limited administrative staff uh, with a five person planning and zoning office and, on, and staff turnover. So what they're doing now, and we've, we've also done that in City Hall in Sioux Falls, is they're trying to develop this one-stop shop process. So they have their economic development office, they have their planning, their building, and their engineering all in one area. To, again, to try to maximize the resources, uh, to make it more efficient, uh, more streamlined for their development process. And they also interact a lot with the counties because again, this development is not only impacting the city of Williston, but it's also impacting the county as well. So dealing with the out-of-town developers is something that we have done a little bit of, but most of our uh, experiences with, with local folks. Uh, but we thought that was really interesting about how you, how you do need to manage that growth to try to maintain the quality um, and, and make sure that it does meet the, the requirements of the community. We did have the opportunity to uh, uh, tour this $70 million recreation center that uh, that they just recently built. And again, it's being funded by this, uh, this extra penny sales tax that the voters uh, approved. And, and Sioux Falls, as you know, we're gonna build our own new indoor recreation uh, facility and it's gonna be basically an, an indoor water uh, facility. But um, they've got a $70 million rec center, which is on a university campus. So that's proven to be a, a really nice partnership. 
It has everything, and I mean everything, and, and to the media, uh, Heather will g provide you a handout, but they've got an A to Z list of things that are within that recreation center. And I'm not gonna go through all of them, but just kind of give you a little flavor. Four tennis courts, a turf field, batting cages, pitching cages, a gym for basketball, volleyball, a 200 meter track. They can actually have an entire track meet within this facility, and that includes pole vaulting and high jump. Uh, they've got a water park, a wave pool, uh, instructional pool, 50 meter Olympic sized pool, a golf simulator, no kidding, a golf simulator, two racquetball courts, two fitness rooms, and, and so much more. Now, again, what did we learn, and what are some things that maybe we could bring back to, to Sioux Falls? Well, again, they paid for it with a voter-approved penny sales tax, it benefits the community, it benefits the workers, it attracts workers, it's good for the university, it's good for quality life, and so much more. Now, um, we also asked, because as you know, we're building our own water uh, 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 park here in, in Sioux Falls, we said, okay, what is the most heavily utilized aspect of the water portion of their recreation center? And uh, they said, with no, no doubt about it, and of course, we're gonna share this with Don and his team, but uh, they said, no doubt about it, the water park. The water park is the most heavily utilized, most beloved part of that entire facility, the water park. Um, and this is gonna make some folks mad, uh, but, but I am gonna share it. Uh, they said they would really caution us on the use of the 50 meter Olympic sized pool. Uh, they said it's not utilized in Williston very, very much, and they just said you should, you should be cautious with that. Now, I, I did push, question their operating plan, and uh, we know that when you operate a, uh, uh, an indoor recreation facility, especially one that has water, it's gonna be expensive to do that. Um, right now, it's being paid for with that, uh, with that uh, sales tax dollars, um, but I will say this, that when we were in there, uh, there were not a lot of folks within this monster building uh, that we were at. Now, we were there in the morning, but again, I kind of questioned, oh boy, you know, operation-wise, how are, how are they going to uh, take care of that? This was our, obviously, our first chance to see Williston, and, and as the mayor said, when we first came into town, I think we were pleasantly surprised about how clean it looked, yeah. and, and it wasn't uh, the disaster that maybe some of us were expecting or envisioning. But as we had a chance to tour at least some of the new developing neighborhoods, um, we were commenting about we have these large clusters of housing, these mega clusters of housing apartments and some single family, some townhomes, some mobile home parks, uh, but it's all housing tracks and you don't see a lot of other services close by. As we said, with the schools and the parks, they're one mile versus our half mile. But even looking at how far do you have to go to find a gas station and a convenience store? It took us a while to find the first yeah. one. They have a new uh, strip mall that's under construction near one of these major residential neighborhoods, but the only tenant was the post office. And so we asked the question, what's going on with retail? Um, and part of the answer is the cost of labor. At one of the local fast food restaurants that starts with the letter M, um, and the, going C. <laughs> MC. <laughs> the going rate is $18 an hour to hire somebody to work at this fast food restaurant. And so that's one of the challenges is finding the labor supply and then just looking at if a retail um, establishment is going to invest in this community, you know, with the workforce that's coming in, more the transient workforce versus more of a permanent workforce like we have here in Sioux Falls, is a major retailer going to do a lot of of uh, investing in the, in the community. So I think that's another challenge that they're seeing in terms of trying to develop maybe what we would call complete neighborhood, where we encourage more mixed uses with services close by, whether it's an office or retail in amongst the housing. And again, the, the rapid pace and the demand for their housing, that's what's really driving uh, the construction market right now. When we were talking with the, uh, the mayor or the president of the commission along with the commissioner, and we were trying to share stories about, you know, what kind of emergencies have you encountered during this boom? 
And, uh, you know, in Sioux Falls, we've had our share of emergencies over the last four years as we've encountered this boom. Uh, I found it intriguing. They've had some, uh, uh, some of their own emergencies. Number one, they've had Missouri River flooding. Uh, this is how dire it was for the city of Williston. They had flooding uh, there in the city of Williston, and if they would have gone one foot more on their dike, one foot more on their dike, they would have lost one fourth, one fourth of their town. Uh, as you fly over Williston, you see how close the, uh, the river is to their town, uh, how dependent, yes, they, they ultimately are on it. You see these sewage lagoons and so much more. Um, but, oh my goodness, they, they truly had, had an emergency at, at, the, at the highest level. Then again, you've got this boom town with all of this construction, all of these uh, manufacturers, all this stuff going on around them. And remember, they've got one code enforcement person, and that person is, uh, has turned over three times in the last four years. Well, they had a major fire in one of their major manufacturing buildings. They call it the Red River Structure Fire. Well, they had, they had this monster fire at 1 a.m. in the morning. And they really didn't know what was in the, what was in the building, what was burning. Um, and there was one thing that saved them that day, one thing that saved their community that day. And if you can imagine South Dakota and Sioux Falls, and you can imagine North Dakota, there was one thing that was missing that day. It was wind. It was the one day that they had where there was no wind. But they were thinking that, you know, that fire, this huge fire with, uh, without knowing what was in it, whether it be a chemical fire or whatever it would be, um, that was something that they too have, ha have had to deal with. And, um, you know, it's one of those things that you just kind of take for granted. You've got this boom town, you're working so hard to keep up with the growth, keep up with the infrastructure, but then there's these things that come your way that you can't control like an emergency. And in reality, those are gonna happen too as you're dealing with the boom. And then I thought this was interesting. Their third greatest emergency, and we talk about emergency, but uh, they, they didn't pull any punches. Their third greatest emergency that they've encountered over the last three years Housing, housing, housing. And you're kind of going, oh, that's interesting. That's an emergency for them. Housing, housing, housing. What are some other community service issues that they're dealing with? And of course, we didn't get a chance to dig into this in too much detail, but just the overall health and well-being, the crime prevention. Uh, they have issues with alcohol problems, drug abuse, prostitution. Uh, Again, we didn't get a lot of chance to talk about that. I was trying to find out the size of their police force, but I wasn't able to find that out. But as the mayor said, with their whole law enforcement process, including the judicial system, everything is backed up tremendously. So crime prevention is a big issue for them as well. And it was interesting that that was not one of their emergencies, but it was one that they have to deal with constantly. And then with the emergency services with their volunteer fire department and volunteer ambulance service, uh, they're looking at maybe making some changes to that. Um, so the whole thing, and even we heard that on occasion they've had to patrol some of the large retail parking lots to eliminate the temporary campers. That's something that they have, they've had to go out and do on a proactive basis. So when you think about the quality of life from this rapid growth, again, you, your, your workforce is primarily uh, single men that come in for designated periods of time they work really hard during their shift, and when they have free time, maybe they go out and like to have fun as well. So that's, that's part of the whole transient demographics of their population that, that's a real issue for them as well. And I'm gonna kind of conclude with some of the kind of the lessons learned that I put down. When you look at Williston Boomtown compared to Sioux Falls, South Dakota Boomtown, think about almost a 20% annual growth rate compared to our two to 3% annual growth rate. Growth is good, growth is necessary, and we want growth, but how do you manage that growth? And uh, how do you plan for that growth? And I think we have an opportunity to do it really well. They're a lot more challenged because again, the, the, the rate. And, and then you look at the sustainable population. When you have the workforce that's coming in for maybe a limited period of time, maybe they're not gonna live there forever. 
So they're just there for a short time. Uh, how does that impact your, your community, your quality of life, the type of services that you need to provide? In Sioux Falls, when people come here, they're usually coming here to stay. And it's primarily families for the most part. So they're here for the long term. And then finally, when you look at your economy and you're dependent on one sector, which is the oil, and you're not sure how long that's going to sustain itself, you can imagine thinking about those long-term investments for a new wastewater treatment plant or a new airport and what's going to happen in 10 years. And they talked about that a lot, the, the uncertainty, the unpredictability of their growth is something that I think uh, we have a better handle on. Um, and so I'm, not, I'm glad I'm not in their shoes. So those are some of my concluding thoughts. And uh, before I give you what I, I mean, there were so many lessons learned. I want to give you some as well. I did want to let you know, uh, I know we had the press conference with Van Epps Park and you saw the <laughs> bottles. You probably want to hear the mayor again. Uh, we actually did bring back some oil. Uh, this is oil. And uh, it's the vintage. one hundredth of a barrel. It's one hundredth of a barrel. Yes. And, uh, uh, but the vintage on this oil is 370 million years old. And I uh, just found that in intriguing. Uh, but um, I also want to give you some of the lessons learned that, that I believe uh, are, are great, great takeaways. Uh, first of all, the businesses in Sioux Falls, I would highly encourage you to take a look at the opportunities that are in Williston. Remember what we talked about. We saw all kinds of building, all kinds of growth, but my goodness, there was no retail there. I mean, very, very limited retail. We are a retail powerhouse in Sioux Falls. There's great opportunity there, uh, folks. I'd, I'd encourage you to look at it. Um, they need retail, they need quality of life, they need health care. Now, you're gonna have to incorporate a unique business model because again, remember we talked about the fast food worker that's making $18 an hour, but uh, Sioux Falls businesses, Sioux Falls visionaries, Sioux Falls investors, I would strongly encourage you to look at that as a potential opportunity. Another. You know, we've got uh, our own issues, our own challenges here in Sioux Falls when it comes to retract, uh, attracting a capable uh, workforce. Uh, well, you know, I, I would encourage the employers of, of Sioux Falls to become even more aggressive in their recruiting and their retention practices. Now, uh, do we have to do housing assistance? I don't know, but affordable housing, it keeps coming up time and time again as one of the obstacles that we have in, in the city of Sioux Falls. Uh, that's something that they are doing there. Stronger wages, stronger benefits. You know, for example, these man camps, which are not just for men, but these man camps, they provide recreational access uh, for, for these uh, folks that are working there as well. Again, so many things that they're doing to try to attract and retain uh, good workers. Another, you know what? Government does need to hold these developers accountable. One thing that Mike didn't mention is that um, they are making them put more skin in the game as they develop in Williston. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to do that more and more in Sioux Falls. However, they were very, very clear on something. When there is a developer, when there is a re uh, someone who's building in Williston, if they are not in compliance, they are not messing around. They are finding them at the highest level. So, that, because again, remember, they don't have compliance folks like we have. So they're, they're not messing around there. If somebody makes a mistake in Williston, the fines are incredibly high uh, in hopes that it's a deterrent that they don't do that uh, again. They want them to get the message. Um, I think another incredible takeaway, and, and I know that again, we wanna be prudent with government. We wanna be responsible with the taxpayer dollar. But uh, one thing is that I don't think you should be cheap uh, or short-sighted when it comes to investing in government. Uh, again, I don't want to be critical of Williston, uh, but, you know, boy, you've got to have oversight. You've got to invest in infrastructure. You've got to have compliance. You've got to have these basic fundamentals when it comes to uh, a government. And in Sioux Falls, that's, that's one of the things that we're trying to, to truly keep, keep ahead of. Um, probably going to make... Uh, some folks in peer mad, but uh, I, think, I think there was a great lesson learned in North Dakota. I mean, there is no reason that cities and towns in South Dakota should not be able to enact their own temporary sales tax. 
when it comes to important projects, as long as it's approved by the voters, as long as there's an end date to it, and as long as it's for a specific need. Uh, I found that uh, North Dakota was, was, was far ahead of South Dakota, uh, and Williston was far ahead of Sioux Falls uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to that. Um, um, and then probably the, the last takeaway uh, is that one of the things that I've learned in life is that my perspective grows, uh, my understanding grows when I go outside of my own little box. Um, you know, we went to Williston, North Dakota uh, to see their boom town. Um, uh, we had no idea what we were going to learn, no idea what we were going to see, uh, no idea what we were going to experience, but I'm really glad that we did. Mm -hmm. Because again, it gives us another perspective on just, I think, how well Sioux Falls is doing, uh, how we are staying one step ahead of growth, how this city is methodical in our approach. We are organized, we are well managed. I love the fact that we're not relying on one economic boom. Uh, we've got multiple legs on our stool, and in the city of Sioux Falls, we've worked really hard to do that. Uh, and yes, we are not satisfied with, uh, with the boom that we already have. We want to keep this boom going. But I will relate to the people of Sioux Falls. We do believe that we are much farther ahead in, in Sioux Falls. Uh, I truly do believe that the uh, citizens of Sioux Falls should be thankful for our boomtown. And we will keep um, you know, tackling the issues and uh, capturing the opportunities uh, that we have here. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, the, uh, we did travel with a business person who does work in um, uh, Williston on a, on a regular basis. And uh, we are, the city of Sioux Falls is gonna pay for our share of that trip. So I wanted to make sure that uh, everybody here knew uh, that we didn't get a free ride. Uh, and really these were the gifts that we got when we came back and I hope that's acceptable to the people of Sioux Falls and, and we'll share the oil with you.